I'm Sharon Yates. Um, I work at the, I'm a researcher at the University of Oslo. Uh, and I'm going to be presenting some of the analysis tools that have been developed as part of the Human Brain Project. Um, and specifically those that can be used either in combination with or that rely on um, 3D Brain Atlas resources for analysis. Um, and the tool that I'm going to focus on is um, Elastic. Um, Elastic is a segmentation tool uh, that has been uh, developed by a team in Heidelberg. So it's not actually developed in Oslo, um, but we are kind of closely collaborating with them. Um, and uh, it is a tool that can be um, used to segment any type of image. So you're not restricted to um, brain um, images, images of brain sections. You can segment anything, um, but you, we use the tool in the context of um, brain sec sections. Uh, the second part of the section, uh, the second part of the um, talk, uh, you're going to hear about about UGEX, which is another tool that can be used to analyze um, human uh, data. Uh, okay, so just a bit of background about tools for segmentation. Uh, the traditional approach to segmentation um, is to threshold based on labeling intensity. Um, for example, with a tool such as ImageJ, um, you normally, uh, when you do segmentation, what you're interested in is kind of pulling out the, like labeling or, or something in the image that you're interested in. Um, so in this context, it would be like labeled cells, um, immunohistochemical, labeling. Um, the challenge is by doing just a traditional um, thresholding of intensity is that it can be very difficult to remove non-specific labeling. Um, it's also difficult to batch analyze um, and uh, a new generation of tools and plugins have been developed um, to kind of solve some of these problems. Um, and Elastic is one of these that uses a supervised machine learning approach. Um, and here you can kind of see an example. So I don't know if it's if you can see, but at the top you have um, a brain section from a mouse, um, and it's been segmented um, based on the thresholding intensity, um, thresholding of the intensity with image J, and you kind of get a lot of speckles and kind of things that you can't remove, um, non-specific labeling. Um, and this one here was done with elastic. It's much cleaner, and we've pulled out just the plaques, which is labeled amyloid plaques, which is what we were interested in in this case. Um, so what is Elastic? Uh, it's a toolbox for interactive image classification, segmentation, and analysis uh, based on supervised machine learning algorithms. Um, it allows you to do segmentation. It also allows you to do a lot of other things. It has lots of different workflows. So kind of what we are going to demonstrate here is not the only thing that you can do with it. So if uh, I would kind of um, encourage you to go and have a look yourself on the Elastic website. Um, it's free and open source. Uh, it allows batch analysis and it is relatively user friendly. Um, okay, so that kind of leads us to the question of why would you want to do a segmentation in the first place? Um, so in this case, I've taken a, an image of a brain section from mouse. I've pulled out the labeling. In this case, it's um, Kolbindin labeling. Um, once you have that segmentation, what can you do with it? Um, and at the University of Oslo, what we've done is developed a workflow uh, that we've called the Quint workflow, um, which allows you to quantify and spatially analyze labeling uh, in the context of um, reference atlas space. Um, and there's actually an article coming out soon on this. Um, and what you do is you segment your image, your brain section, um, and this can then be combined with that customized at atlas maps, which are produced with the Quickney software that you just saw. Um, uh, and this combination is done with uh, an application called Nutil Quantifier. So this is also software that's available for available online. You can download it on nitric.org. Uh, it comes with a 
very extensive user manual. Um, and it basically does a quantification for you um, with output uh, per brain atlas region. Um, you get reports, you get coordinates, which allow you to visualize your objects in 3D atlas space. So we have a, our own viewer for, uh, that you can also access to be able to look at the objects in 3D. Um, and you get these images, which are basically the segmentations overlaid on the um, atlas maps. Um, Okay, so going back to elastic, um, for classification with elastic, it has two main workflows. Um, so the first thing you would do is you upload your images to the pixel classification workflow. Um, and that one does a classification based on user annotations that you kind of manually put on yourself. Um, and the pixel features intensity, color and texture. So kind of the added value of using Elastic over just using the traditional intensity thresholding is that it also takes into account the color and uh, texture of your image. Um, and often that's all you kind of need to do, then you can export segmentations. Um, but in some cases, the segmentations that you get out are kind of not good enough really for quantification because you might have a lot of non-specific labeling that's also pulled out. Uh, and in this case, it could be useful, useful to do an object classification step, which kind of follows uh, the first step, um, where you can filter out objects um, based on object level features such as size and shape. So here's an example uh, where I have an image um, of a section labeled for amyloid plaques, where I've used the pixel classification workflow first to extract all the labeling. Um, but then you have this kind of non-specific labeling around the edges that I want to get rid of. Um, and so I've applied the object classification workflow and classified based on object um, size and shape, because you can see that the kind of circular objects are very different um, in size and shape compared to this elongated non-specific labeling. Um, okay. But uh, for the pixel classification, you had set up there, it was also based on texture. What does that yeah. mean? Yeah, it means that, OK, I'm going to explain a bit about that here. Um, so the texture, it can kind of recogni recognize textural patterns. So if you have, uh, and it does so, um, so the algorithm is kind of built up so that it detects patterns within a 10 by 10 pixel window, which means that if you have, like here, for example, you have kind of light pixels followed by a bit darker pixels and then goes to the very black pixels. That is a pattern that it can recognize. So it recognizes the edge, not just based on the intensity difference, but also that is this kind of um, light to dark texture. Um, so that's why when you, one of the considerations you have to take into account when you do classification with elastic is that the um, resolution of your image has actually has quite a big impact on both the quality of the input output um, and the processing speed because the, the bigger the image kind of the slower the processing time um, uh, yeah so ideally it's best to kind of resize your images so that the objects or the edges of objects fall within this 10 by 10 pixel window because if it's outside of this range, then the program is not going to be able to see it, kind of to detect it. Um, so my, my kind of recommendation is usually to downscale as much as is possible without kind of losing the information that you're interested in. Because you can't kind of, if you downscale too much, you actually lose um, information. You might even lose objects. Um, yeah. So the practical session uh, is a bit similar to the Quickney one in that you have access to some images which um, are um, lying in the session four folder called images. Uh, we're going to classify and then extract segmentations with the pixel classification workflow. Uh, it's a bit of a, one of the silly things about the um, Elastic program is that when you export the segmentations, the images are always black by default, which is kind of very confusing for new users. Um, this is because the, uh, basically a black color has been applied to all the classes. That's kind of the default um, setting in Elastic. 
So even though it has been classified, it doesn't look like it's been classified, which is why we have to uh, apply the Gillespie lookup table to the segmentations, just so that we can see or basically applying different color to the different classes. Um, and then uh, at that stage, like once you have your segmentations, that's when you would take it into the new tool software. We're not going to have time to cover that today. Um, but, one, but we're going to explore some of the new tool output, um, some of the coordinate output. So you can have a look in our viewer. And then, of course, you can go and, and look yourself if you're interested in the workflow. Um, read the article when it comes out and kind of the, download the software and read the user manual. Um, yeah, so this is just a sneak preview of um, how the objects look in the 3, 3D uh, viewer, which is mesh view. Um, yeah. So I think we're going to do this in an interactive way. So I'll open Elastic on my computer. And then you can do it live. Uh, so open, open the software first. Wait. You might have to move the window to the right, I think. Try to move the window to the right. Hi. I don't know what happened. No, it's something to do with. Oh. Yeah, I think it was yeah, they just knocked it or something. Yeah. yeah. Has everyone got it open? You're it's locked by my system administrator. I downloaded it, but I didn't try to open it. Yeah. You can also kind of, uh, this is actually a session where you can work together as well and kind of, just to kind of get a feel. Um, yeah, so as you can see, there are a lot of different things that you can do with it. Uh, so segmentation is definitely not the only thing. Uh, you can use it to work with uh, 3D images, with 2D images. You can also work with videos that are kind of moving over time. Uh, so it does a lot of different things. Um, but we're interested in pixel classification at the top. Um, and what you want to do is to save your project somewhere. Um, so you can save it into the folder with your images uh, in, in the session four folder. Um, yeah, so I'm going to save it here. And then it should open. It might take, yeah, there. Um, <clears throat> and then you want to upload your images. Do you want help? No, just... okay. So to upload your images, you go to add new and add separate image, images. And then just highlight uh, all the images that are in that folder. Is everyone at the stage ready to move on? Yeah. Um, to make uh, to make the file more stable, a tip is to save all the images actually to the project file. Um, to do that, you highlight all the images and click on Edit Shared Properties, and then change the storage to Copy to Project File, and then press OK. And then it, and then it says that you have to save the file at the step. So go to project and then save pro save project. I wouldn't usually go to save as, just save uh, save project. Good. Uh, the next step is to go to feature selection. 
I think mine's still saving, which is why it's uh, being a bit slow. You can see at the bottom there's a kind of, yeah. Um, okay, so for the feature selection, you want to select the features that you want to include uh, in the classification algorithm. Uh, the advice that I would give is just to include everything. If you have very, very big images, um, then a tip can be to kind of select features a bit randomly like this. Um, these are the different scales. So this is what I was talking about with the, um, that it can recognize ob kind of edges of objects or textures up to a scale of 10 by 10 pixels. So you can see that the number at the top, I don't know if I have these numbers here represent the scale. So this is the 10 by 10 pixel window, whereas this would be a one by one pixel window. So it's kind of recognizing textures on different scales. Um, but yeah, we'll just include everything and press OK. And then the next step is to start the training. So in this, uh, here you would create some classes. So in general, you want to extract your labeling, which is the carbine and labeling here in black. Um, so you usually would have background and then labeling as your classes. So I'm going to change this one to um, label background. Is everyone following? Yeah. Uh, and then uh, if you have the handout, it tells you like how to navigate. So it's really useful to have a mouse. Um, if you hold control and then use your wheel, you can kind of zoom in and zoom out. Um, and to navigate, you press shift uh, and then just move around your image. And usually when I kind of so the first step is to annotate your image, um, to place some labels of each class. And I usually zoom in kind of until I can start to see the individual pixels. Um, and then I place some labels. So I can say, okay, this is background. And so you then, just do a wide, across a wide swath like that? Yeah, just label, label some example pixels. Um, it can be useful to kind of label not just lines to actually kind of take um, a blob or whatever um, so that it starts to recognize if there are any patterns, for example. Um, you can also just, yeah, have a go, place a few labels. You don't need to place so many before you press the live update button. And when you press that one, it does, it does kind of automatic predictions on your image. Um, and to be able to see the results, because this is, it shows the probabilities, um, which are not so easy to kind of see the boundaries, how it's, what it's really classifying. So I usually turn that one off. And then it has lots of different overlays that you can turn on and off to be able to explore the segmentation. So I'll turn on the label segmentation. And when I do that, I see that it's not really, uh, it's pulling out a bit more than I want it to pull out. So I'm going to place some more labels. You can turn on this uncertainty overlay and that identifies basically all the pixels in your image of which the classifier is unsure of the class. So by specifically labeling those pixels, you very quickly improve, um, improve the predictions. Um, so I'm going to zoom in. It's always kind of at the boundaries between background and labeling that it helps to place more labels. Um, so I'm gonna switch. So I'm gonna say that this is labeling. This is background. 
So if you had like dual color staining or something, you could also label all the different colors. Yeah, so you can create as many classes as you want. Um, the more classes you have, the more kind of time consuming the updates take, like it gets more heavy. Um, so I usually try to keep it to as few classes as I can, but definitely if you have kind of two or three, or three or four things that are interesting, you can try and segment kind of in one image. Um, can you also yeah. classify the probabilities of um, class number one, very certain, class number two, a little bit certain, and class number three, uncertain? Uh, you definitely you definitely could do it kind of depends a bit what you want to do with the image at the end so in my case I just want to extract the labeling because I want to take it into the quint workflow to allow me to do a quantification so in a way there wouldn't be any reason to kind of have this in between uncertain class you just have to make a judgment um, a kind of educated judgment about where you want that boundary to be um, but you might have another, you might want to use it for something else, another workflow or something, and then definitely you can, you can do whatever you want to do. Um, I'm going to zoom out. So kind of the, f the more zoomed out you are, um, the longer these updates take, because it actually has to do a prediction of everything in the image. So it's very important to kind of be a bit patient and wait until it's updated, because otherwise the program can crash. It's doing it for the area you're, that's in the Yeah, it's kind so of live. It's a live so thing. So at the end, when you feel like you've got all of your things appropriately trained, then yeah. you would zoom all the way out to do it? Or what would you do? What you do then is you can move to, I mean, if you think that the image, if the image is very, very large, um, and you think that maybe it's a bit too much for the program to handle, then my recommendation is to kind of train zoomed in and then scroll around to kind of get a feel for how it's predicting in other parts of the image. Um, and then when you're happy, you can actually select the next image in your series because the whole point of kind of training a classifier like this is that you want to apply it to maybe a whole series of images. Um, but then you need to kind of adjust that algorithm so that it fits not just for your one image, but also for other images in the series. So these images that I've uploaded are in a way like training, they're training images, so they're a subset of, of a whole series. So, and then you'll run it later on. And then you can that. run it, you can apply it to a whole series of images. You can apply it to hundreds of images and it'll do, it'll export segmentations um, kind of automatically. You can leave it running overnight and you don't see anything, but you get the output for everything. Um. Yeah, so this is another image. Um, I'm going to kind of look a little bit. So the, the difficult part with this is always deciding, you know, what is labeling and what isn't labeling. And that is the kind of, that, I mean, you have to make your own judgment. Um, and it is, of course, easier to make those decisions if you have higher resolution images. So that's always the kind of the difficult thing with deciding, you know, should I work at a bit higher resolution? Um, but then the extraction is more time consuming. It's more computationally heavy. Um, I might not get as good output. I think it's pretty good. So there's um, it says current view, kind of here, where you can um, open any image in the series, and then it automatically applies the algorithm to the next image and does a prediction. Yeah, so in a way, you, um, everyone can just kind of play around a bit with their images until they're happy. Uh, I can, once it's finished updating, I'll kind of show you what to do when, you, when you're happy with your classifier. Um, then you go to kind of the prediction export thing here, which allows you to choose your um, settings for um, export. 
and yeah, you can export like different formats and um, you can combine it. I mean, it, what you want to export is going to depend a lot what you want to use the image for. But in the context of our workflow, um, it's only compatible with PNG images. Uh, so I want to export a PNG image. Uh, I have to have the 8-bit. The unsigned 8-bit. Work. Yeah, okay. And you have to change the um, type of image to a simple segmentation. I want a segmentation image. I don't want a probability file. Um, if you wanted to do an object classification afterwards uh, to kind of remove non specific labeling, then you would want to export the um, probabilities because that's the input that's required for the object classification workflow. Um, these kind of things are all explained. There's a user manual on the Elastic website. So kind of you, there's a lot of information there. Um, and then you just click the export all. Um, if you want to apply the classifier to kind of a whole series of images, you go to the batch export um, applet, and then you can upload hundreds of images and kind of apply the classifier, and it'll do an automatic export of all your segmentations. But we're just going to apply it to these training images that we have. And it takes time. So it's kind of, I think, for this number of images, it should take about 10 minutes. Um, so either if you kind of get that far, you can export them. Um, otherwise, I think we have some images that you can have a look at, uh, some example output. Is there a way to download what the classifier is? The actual yeah algorithm. I would have to ask the Elastic team. It is. It They're is. very. It is. Yeah. 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 It probably is. They're quite active on uh, GitHub. So if you have any questions for them, uh, kind of more to do with the programming side, I would contact them directly because that's not. Yeah, you can, you can, I mean, it's already saved in the project file. Yeah, it's saved. But saving. you can also explicitly uh, um, uh, write the classifier to disk and the version then and exchange them and the classifier in the languages, yeah. Yeah. I know that, like, because I'm not a computer programmer, so it's kind of, I know you can work in headless mode and you can do all sorts of things with it, but it's, yeah. I, I stick to just yeah. using the user in interface. Um, yeah. And what we're trying to do mainly is to make these tools accessible to people who don't have that programming background. Yeah, that sounds great. You know, we get questions into our help email at the elements. You know, how can we segment things? Yeah, yeah. Don't know. We'll find a tool that works for you. But That's but true. If you have um, microscopic images with shading um, artifacts in the four corners, for example, yeah. um, how does the uh, classifier, how stable is the classifier? How stable if so you have... if you have um, yeah. a, sh a continuous shading shift to the borders, and yeah. there you have, would have a specific Helmandine labeling and you want to detect mm. it, yeah. is it how, how stable does it Yeah, because then it's kind of, uh, it wouldn't be able to use the intensity thresholding because that would pull out just in certain parts of the image and not others. Um, so then the textural component might be able to kind of pull things out if it identifies that kind of border between that light to dark textural border um, that would be present both in the darker part of the section and the lighter part of the section. It might still be able to get a good segmentation. But you just have to have a go and see, you know, if it works or not. In principle, it just needs training examples in, in the It needs, regions. yeah. So in that case, you would simply uh, you would do some annotations in the corners and in the center of the image, mm. and it should be able. It should be able to do it. That's kind of one of the advantages. Robust, so it's, uh, it doesn't learn the threshold or something like that. It's much more complicated. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It uses a whole whole range of, of different features. Features. Extra, Feature. Feature. Hmm? Picture vector with complexity, yeah, complexity of 
it 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 it. I mean, you can select the features. It, it, it chooses from a whole range of texture yeah. features, yeah. and then it learns a, a non-linear combination of these features. So mm. here, example, um, this um, um, uh, Fourier descriptor. Yeah. I'm not sure if it has explicitly Fourier descriptors in. Maybe you can choose them there. It's a feature selection over there. So yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. You select your own features. So the, the features are edge. It, it is kind of texture and intensity, mm -hmm. color. Okay. Are the features it I can recognize? First and second derivatives at different at different learn levels and all, all sorts of stuff. Yeah. So you were, you were class training the classifier. You only mainly did the pixel classification. Yeah. You didn't do the object. No. So if I wanted to do object object classification, like this for example, I think is um, this is something that's not specific labeling. I think this was something, some artifact around, yeah, something. Um, so you to could get have circled some of those, and it could have pulled out for you the. Yeah. So if I wanted to do object classification on this image, I would export the probability mm -hmm. maps. I would then open the probability maps in the object classification workflow, which looks similar to this, in that you can um, you also select your features. So which features do I want to include in my classifier? But then it has object level features, such as you know, object size, object shape, um, how many spines does it have? Where is it positioned in your image? You know, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a massive list of features you can select from. Um, so that, I could see that being useful if, like, for instance, we had people trying to train the classifier for analyzing behavioral videos of a mouse face, which is they to do a behavioral task. Yeah. You know, it might not be able to do something really uh, intricate, but it, would be, it might be able to find whiskers. It might be able to find mm. uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it does, like, uh, I think I've seen kind of videos of elastic being used to track mice moving around over time um, based on they kind of recognize distinct features of the mice and how they're moving around yeah in 3d over time and I don't know it, it, you can do a lot of things with the software so it's definitely not just what I'm showing here those artifacts all those tissue bubbles we actually have documented where all those things are yeah in the okay they had some manually went through and found them. Yeah. At some point, tag them all. That's a lot of data. Yeah. Okay. Maybe not all. Yeah, and see, I should read a bit more the documentation. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Which would have been a lot easier. Let me see, we can go to session four. Um, yeah, so this, this kind of shows some typical output. So this is after the um, Glasby lookup table has been applied because the output that you get from um, Elastic is black. Um, this, I'm going to see if oh, it's the wrong format. That's silly. Yeah, I've, I've exported uh, the wrong format here, so I can't actually open them. Um, How's it going for everybody? It's kind of pulled out a lot. <laughs> yeah, you started it as well. 
going to Okay, I actually exported, um, I was planning to export PNG images, uh, simple segmentations, but I exported the wrong format. Um, and I haven't actually got examples of the black images, but if you do export PNG images in um, sim for the segmentations, um, to apply colors, you would use image J. So I'm gonna open an image in image J. And then obviously this one already has colors, but it would be black. Um, and then I would go to um, image, lookup tables, and apply the Glasby lookup table. Yeah, and you'd get out something like this. So this is just kind of, it's a random uh, table of colors that it applies. So it applies a different color to each of your channels. Just, and those colors are, um, um, yeah, it's just a table of colors. Um, but you can change the colors by going to uh, image um, colors and then edit lookup table. So if I want, uh, want it to, to look a bit nicer. And this is all explained in the manual, so it's just kind of it can be a bit when you're a new user and you start using the software and you just get this black image out. It's just kind of, oh my goodness, it hasn't worked. What did I do wrong? Um, but yeah. And then you're ready for uh, the next step, which would be to, so if you have these segmentations and you have Atlas maps that you've exported for, from the Quickney um, software, then you can use the Newtil software to combine them and actually get quantitative data per Atlas region. Um, for the next part of the session, um, I have some um, Nutil output. Uh, so you can open, there's actually in the handout, there's a link to a viewer, uh, which is our own um, 3D Atlas viewer called MeshView. Um, I think the, this handout should also be included in the folder with session four, so you can open the link um, and then It looks this way. I'm going to open it from scratch. So, like, yeah, so here, this is just to get you a feel for kind of what you can do with the output of Newtil. Uh, so what I would go, uh, go to is to hide all the regions in the atlas and then just switch on the root. Um, 
and then you can navigate to some of the uh, coordinate files, which are the output of NewTil. Um, they're located in the session four folder, in the NewTil output folder, and they're JSON files. So if you select this 3D combined, that kind of is the whole, the whole image series. And then you can reduce the point size so it actually shows each pixel. Um, and then you can see how, um, you know, these are literally all the objects um, that have been extracted through the segmentation that have been, uh, those segmentations have been kind of anchored um, or matched with the atlas maps. And then the coordinates have been extracted and you can see everything in 3D. And you can kind of switch on different regions to kind of see where things are located. So this is also something that you can just have a play with. <laughs>